All right, what's up, class? This is Optimus Fields at My Living True. We're back for Teacher's Lounge. We're at block height 653,766, and the current price is 12,884. And uh, Nick, you wanna you wanna say something or? Uh, no, we can we can jump right into it. All right, cool. I'm excited for tonight. All right, cool. Yeah, so uh, we we got a we got a full class today. It's pretty packed up in here. So thanks, thanks for everyone coming out. Um, we have a few topics over here, but um, I think the first thing we can start off with is uh, we had on the list that we should talk about the price hitting 12k. But as everyone here is well aware, we hit 13k, or at least we kissed 13k today, and we were all super bullish on Twitter. So uh, I guess it just it feels good to be back feels real good to be back guys uh what what are your guys' thoughts let's go <laughs> <laughs> about time did you guys see an there. uptick in the number of friends texting you today about bitcoin <laughs> bro we're, we're, we're not there yet bro we're not there yet we're not there yet. i know but it's still we're getting close we're getting close this is true no, the, ne- no, next wait until next 25 year. to gloat that's the uh that's what's real. <laughs> Mixed emotions here, boys. Speak about it. I mean, who, who, who's planning on stop working? <laughs> right. So I mean, seriously, unless unless you're spending every cent you're making, I mean, you want Bitcoin to be reasonable priced so you can stack your excess, at least for at least for a year or two. I don't want to see this fucking thing go crazy in the next two years. I want to see it just fucking slowly build up and fucking climb, right? Who, I, the big green cancels scared the shit out of me more than the big red cancels, personally. It feels like no one has enough Bitcoin. It's like in this, you, you just cannot physically have enough. Everyone like just pushes the boundaries further and further, and it's like I feel constantly like ah, not enough, not enough. It's never, never, never enough. It's like a drug. You take it, yeah, exactly. it feels good, well, and then it fades, and then you're like, I want more. It's not even that. I mean, you just got to realize your income stream. I mean, fast forward, seriously. Think about how much you're going to make over the next 10, 20 fucking years, right? And if you think the dollar's going to shit, which we all do, you want to stack Bitcoin, and you don't want to stack Bitcoin at fucking thirty, forty thousand, fifty thousand, hundred thousand. You don't want that. You want to stack. You want to stack it between ten and twenty. I'd love to see us all get a fucking year consolidation between ten and twenty. We stack the fucking shit out of this thing, and then we go. <laughs> and and I mean, it's you know. Hey, aim into that. I I would love to see that. But uh, I don't know if we're gonna get that, dude. It feels like we're we're off to the races now. I'm and just curious. Kind of in that. We've been in that range for a while now. I'm curious to see if the rest of the week will continue going up, or if we'll see a drawback, like tomorrow or Thursday. What are your I'm thoughts curious. on that? The RSI isn't even oversold. You know, and I don't even use like the daily RSI like, for every, for everyone that doesn't know what RSI is basically this indicator is technical indicator on charts that kind of, you know, rep- I'm going to put it in the group chat. So you guys know what I'm talking about. Because and it kind of way oversold. No, oh, but I, I, I don't way look at the on every I, time frame. <laughs> Jim, I don't look. There's I don't definitely look at a pullback coming. There always is. That's what look, traders look, look. do. I'm gonna put it. I'm gonna put it in the chat so you guys know what I'm talking about. But on the five-year one, which is the only one I use, it's it looks to me at least, Jim, um, that it's not. So you got only two periods to go by in your chart instead of yeah. hourly, four hours, look, twelve hours. Look, I just put it in the. Good luck with that one. I don't try. I don't trade, Jim. I don't trade. This is just so what I look at. Finding out a trading indicator and on a five-year chart of it. Yeah. Because it was the question. Chart, it was the question, man. I'm answering the question. I don't <laughs> it's overbought, dude. On every RSI time. Look at look at look at the thing. Look at the thing. 
Look, it's not over. It's going to 14k before I retrace. Look at the chart 20 times a day, dude. <laughs> I like that big consultants. 14k. Imaginary lines. Imaginary lines. It is. It totally is. Totally is. That's it why is, you don't trade. It is, but guys <laughs> trade on that shit. That's the only reason I look at it. I don't trade either, but you you just go look at an RSI pattern and then look at where the drops are, and they always come after it's overbought. Always. Traders do that shit. They get scared and they start selling. They think they got to take their profits. Silly, but whatever. You'll see. It's it's quad four, though, Jim. Where, where? Oh, yeah, I know all about quad <laughs> four. I listened to that whole interview. What a joke. <laughs> I'm driving right now, you guys. We were just testing waves in the wave pool tent. Oh, uh, let's I, go. I, I missed a lot of Nick's uh, presentation. I, I apologize. Uh, I'll go back and listen to it. But, uh, yeah, we're, we're, we're doing good with the wave pool tent. So, that was awesome. How are the waves, Jim? How big? Uh, the waves right now are not big. I surfed today for a little while. It's like waist to chest high. But it's going to start picking up tomorrow. And we're going to get like 8 to 10 foot waves for a couple days because of a hurricane. So, I'm pretty psyched. Pretty Eight strong. to ten, you're a fucking madman. I don't do anything. Oh, dude, I, four. I, I would surf twenty if it was clean and there was a channel and I didn't have to paddle through it. I <laughs> snowboard black diamond like, like it's going out of style. I'm stoked on that shit. I want to go fast, and hard, and I'm not afraid of big waves. I mean, if it gets too big, I'm afraid, but <laughs> I'll still go up to twenty foot. I could do it. We get we get fifteen foot waves on Long Island, and everybody gets excited. It's rare, but we get them. Let's go. Anyway. Yeah, We've anyways. Been for 46 years. Yeah, back to Bitcoin. <laughs> yeah, man. Fuck. And let's talk about some RSI <laughs> indicators. I'm looking at it right Sorry. now. <laughs> yeah. Is it? Yeah, it's definitely, I, I would, uh, I would, definitely I would way overbought on the daily. Yeah, the weekly the weekly is just around right. 70, though. Which is like the very top of the RSI. Yep, yep, yep. I did notice. It's only on fourth, uh, is it fourth green candle in a row for weekly or something? Wasn't there a weekly pullback a couple weeks back? I forget. Remember that chart? Yeah. The tricky thing about the RSI is it could make a high, then make a new high. Oh, yeah. Or the yeah. price over, could make over. a new high, but the RSI will make a, new, a lower high. So the price could keep going, but the RSI might make a lower high. It has to slow down. It's a relative strength indicator. It has to, the trading has to slow down, and then that number will drop even when the price is not really going down. But it has to slow down. So it just takes time. 20K tomorrow morning. <laughs> then it's not going down. That RSA is going through. The roof. Twitter would blow up, dude, if that happened. We went from, what, 12, 12 and a half to, like, 17 in 2017 in, like, one day? Yeah, I got the it screenshot of happen. it. It can definitely happen. It went up five thousand, and I think nine dollars, which was forty percent at the time in one day. Jesus Christ! But that was also like a blow off top, so yeah. I don't yeah. know if we'll see that right now, like this early in in the bull run. Oh, definitely <laughs> not. But I think some of those moves are definitely going to be normalized in the future. Who knows when though? Well, we're we're already you got a new. Oh, oh, you got Optimus. Huh? Uh, you got a new BG. has got a question in the chat. Oh, okay, hold on. I was just gonna say we we uh, we're already normalized at one K green candles. So let's see what. <laughs> okay, hold on. What I this question about dating Christians is that what we're talking about? No, dude, the one up top. <laughs> no, I wouldn't have interrupted you for that. Um, no, but the one that says uh, bad word RSI, do KBDCs pit private pit private banks against central banks? Are private banks going to be forced into being pro BTC in an attempt to temporarily oh, okay. stay? Um, honestly, I'm I'm not so sure, but uh, Jester. You want to jump into the central bank digital currencies since you, you were all on them yesterday? And then we can go uh, into Ben's, Ben's topic. Yeah, there's a, a couple of just pieces of news that uh, kind of like got onto my radar. Um, I think the first one was Simon Dixon's uh, kind of 
uh, investigation of what the IMF was was doing, and they, it, he just did a fantastic digest of like all of the the rhetoric coming out of the the IMF um, about creating central bank digital currencies, and they were like noticing all the flaws in our current uh, financial system, and were were like pushing the idea that a lot of these issues that we're experiencing right now um, with like sort of a dollar crisis globally um, and lots of like dollar denominated debt outside of the US that we might be able to solve all those problems and uh, give the world economic prosperity by deploying a uh, digital currency um, as far as just like being able to deliver money where it's needed uh, in the world, you know, quickly and efficient, and efficiently. Um, and Simon Dixon just went through that point by point and just ripped that argument apart uh, because it's it's all a load of crap. Um, like, yes, there's some upsides to digital currencies, like something that we all we all realize. Uh, but what's What's not clear, what, what the IMF was not speaking about was how much control every country and every jurisdiction would be sacrificing by moving towards what could potentially be a global currency that is outside of the people's control. Um, so I was, I was really excited to see him just tear that apart. And then I saw Raul Paul go through it um, and he's just becoming more and more of a maximalist day by day. So yeah, I, I broke down and wrote a post on, on satbase.org on central bank digital currency. Definitely inspired. And um, yeah, Raul Paul scared me this time. <laughs> um, so yeah, I was, uh, I was, you know, I was just writing an email to my, to my parents. Um, and then I was just like, no, this is, this is more important to get out to, to people. So I wrote a post on the website. Yeah, um, I completely just just for is exactly right. Uh, for anyone, I really recommend that video. But what just uh, what just was talking about that Simon Dixon video is just he's he has a really good insight and he's been doing this for a couple of years now. And um, there there's there's two components right uh, to answer B Jarv. I can't say your name, but you know who I'm talking about to answer your question specifically on private banks. So private banks are are, are fucked, right? Like, what do I mean by that? I mean, like, the Wells Fargo's, the Bank of America's, the retail banks, right? They're super screwed because there's two components to this. There's the digital, uh, central bank digital currencies, which is going to enable um, basically a central bank like the Fed to direct payments to the consumer. So instead, uh, to the citizen, whatever you want to call it, right? So instead of Instead of how it works now, where the central bank pays it to a retail bank and then the consumer uses it, a central bank digital currency would allow basically the 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 central bank to make direct payments to the consumer. But not only direct payments, also because they're not going to do this just because they're good people. They're doing it for tax reasons, right? It's gonna be it's gonna enable ca uh, tax col collection in a much more efficient manner because they know exactly how much you have in your wallet. And they're just gonna, you know, be able to take it away, right? And then there's the other side of the, there's the other side of the coin. You see companies like Cash App and now Venmo, PayPal just announced it today, and Robinhood, they're launching debit cards, and you could actually deposit, you could do direct deposits. They give you a bank account number directly to Cash App, right? So as the decade progresses, the the old school retail banks are just gonna get left out in the dust, right? And then you have this beacon of hope, right? where you know society could either go the side of 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 the of the central bank digital currencies and that scares the crap out of me right because that's like that's total fascism that's like 1984 right like imagine having a wallet that the government has total control over right and there's no retail bank acting as like the middleman they do a terrible job it's like they have direct control over that crap you know it's it's very insidious it's very evil now that's how society can go, right? And the other way is basically the way of Bitcoin, right? So it's going to be in very interesting to see how that that like unravels. You know, it's going to happen this decade, right? So it's going to be a very interesting decade. And an another part that kind of scares the crap out of me is that this central bank digital currencies 
is going to allow a significant more amount of money printing, right? Because they want to annihilate cash. That's the end goal, right? And what the, the, the bad thing about cash is that it actually hampers their ability to print more money unchecked, right? So there's like this consortium of central banks right now. It's called the IMF that they they really want to do this. You know, it's going to allow them to basically, you know, unleash helicopter money, collect to collect taxes more efficiently and, you know, and, and seize assets at the like literally at the flip of a switch. Right. It's 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 freaking terrifying. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. Have, have you read the report? Because like some of the shit they're talking about, it's like super draconian like they're talking about like you know they can with a cbdc they can set like individualized interest rates and stuff like that so like my interest rate might be different than yours so like they can like individually like, you know track like at this interest rate i do the most optimal thing that they want so then that's what the, the interest rate they're going to give me and then you know if another person if they have like a lower interest rate they spend more and maybe they'll give it that to that person and it's just like it's just yeah, like so, ridiculous the amount of like finite control they're gonna try to get through this, and it's like so insidious. It's just like it's, it's honestly it's evil, but it's absolutely terrifying. I completely agree. It's absolutely terrifying, and I, I did read the whole report because I had to cover it for the show that I do, and and yeah, man, it's it's terrifying. It should tear the it should terrify the fuck out of all you guys, right? And but you guys all have an option, right? And the the most powerful vote that you can have is just deciding to opt out of their shenanigans you know and the way that you opt out is just put your working capital into bitcoin right and you know and then you could just skip all that you don't have to you don't have to deal with that insanity yeah, but honestly if you can receive helicopter money i will be first in line to get this helicopter money on my whatever app and then just convert it to bitcoin you know right away so everything is good for Bitcoin, I guess. They, 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 so so initially, the central bank digital currencies will not be a direct competition to Bitcoin. Well, it will be a direct competition to are the are the retail banks, right? The belt, the Wells Fargo, the Bank of America, the City Groups, all that. They hate that. It literally it makes them completely irrelevant. Eventually, it might be a competition to Bitcoin because it, it like think about it this way, like what you said, right? Like those those systems don't work unless everyone is under them if you have the ability to opt out it ruins it it, it, it takes away their power to print you know it takes away they, they they only work if everyone's under that same umbrella i'm telling you guys it's super goddamn insidious it scared the crap out of me when i read it yeah for sure i agree like uh, for me the cash like gives us opportunity to you know interact freely and um i'm, I'm just thinking that with more education people will see the flow of the system and like if it will be easy to convert this you know new cryptocurrency quote unquote yeah to bitcoin i don't see a like i hope that people will be educated enough not to use this app and not to be part of the system but just use it as free airdrop money that can be later converted to real you know money that are that is limited i can you guys hear me yeah i think the average person i think the way they introduce it is the ubi i think they use it to to uh pump up people's bank accounts give them money and then just start it going i you know i think it'll be used but i don't think there's any value there other than transactional value I think actually it's going to help Bitcoin. Personally, you could ex you could expect them to put restrictions on what you can spend it on, and you're not going to be able to trade it for Bitcoin. Well, you could do like peer to peer trading, or like I mean, I assume they'll have the functionality where I can send it to a friend, and then uh, same thing where you know you find a friend that wants Bitcoin and then buy it through there. Yeah, but you're not going to be able to go through on ramps yeah, off no. ramps like you can now that's a huge difference i mean how many people can yeah, you walk yeah. up and say can you sell me some bitcoin i was at a meetup in new york city last night no one was selling any bitcoin i promise you <laughs> and and people were asking jokingly each other hey can i buy some bitcoin from you and it was like yeah sure dude <laughs> <laughs> that's a valid so. point yeah. yeah on this note yeah i don't, I don't know if you know but uh, china just air dropped 1.5 million uh, worth of dollars on some lucky lottery winners and there are like 3,000 
merchants that are accepting this whatever uh, new digital currency. So it seems like China is already on it. They 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 really like real life uh, testing uh, their new digital currency. Yeah. Yeah. The the concern for me. Uh, well, I like uh, Nathaniel Whitmore covered a little bit about uh, how that. Um, how that central bank digital currency was received and you know people weren't really crazy about it but yeah they spent it for sure uh i think the concern for me is like of course people love getting helicopter money but will that teach them what they need to know to become a bitcoiner like how do you how do you build a bitcoiner and if they're distracted by getting this helicopter money all the time uh, will they be asking the difficult questions of you know like what happens when uh, the central bank de determines that, you know, your money is only worth half as much tonight. Um, and it will just happen fast, you know, just like Argentina lost half the value or the buying power of their money overnight. Uh, something like that could happen immediately and it would be completely out of their control. To bring it to a more like happy part, I think this could be like a very nice thing for bitcoin because um like a big problem with bitcoin today is like ux kind of sucks and uh like a lot of these things are just because like there's just not a lot of people working on ux for bitcoin at least not as much as compared to like you know like a venmo or paypal and stuff like that's been like being an iterated on for like 20 years or something so if like a, if like a central bank and a government start like actually like making apps for this like they're probably going to solve some UX problems that Bitcoin has. And, you know, we could just copy that over in the Bitcoin and that'll be very nice because, you know, then it's just going to make it easier for other people to work on, like to use Bitcoin eventually. And, uh, and even if like the, even if like UX doesn't get better, like at least people get more used to a like digital currency and a digital wallet, which is just another part where like just getting people used to the idea of having, you know, your money is stored on your phone, not, and you know wells fargo whatever skeef do you want to jump in well i i just think it's like we saw today um you know paypal paypal is officially quote unquote in the crypto space now even though they're not you know even really letting you withdraw bitcoin so <clears throat> i think uh ben like you're right you know it gives Bitcoin some sense of legitimacy to the average person. They're starting to see like, oh, wow, big banks are, you know, getting into this crypto Bitcoin space. And now PayPal is, you know, cryptocurrency. And so it's just a matter of time until the retail wave comes in and everyone's like, oh, wow, what are these Bitcoin things or what are the cryptocurrencies? They're actually real money and it's not just some fake Internet, you know, joke. And so. Yeah, I, th I think it's only a matter of time until the the more eyes on on the space brings improvements to the user experience and and also you know price pumps and stuff. So, uh, but what what are your guys' thoughts on the whole PayPal news? You know, first they fight you and then they join you, right? I think it's it's in the right it's a step in the right direction, but again. They added a ton of shit coins, and they don't allow you to withdraw or send it to the other people. Which, I mean, I heard that uh, Cash App, when it first started doing Bitcoin, that they didn't allow you to withdraw it or send it to other people. So I definitely think there's potential for PayPal to come to their senses and do the same, but not a fan of the shit coins. Can you yeah, and... exactly cover what what PayPal announced? Like I've read I've read some news on it, but I don't know exactly if they announced how the product is gonna look like, what kind of features they actually will have there. Can somebody cover it? You can buy it's like Bitcoin, Litecoin, Bcash, and ETH. And that's basically it. And then they like tease that they're going to allow you to send to merchants eventually. But uh, you can't withdraw it, KYC. They could take it away at any moment. Um, you know, so 
Well, I'm good. Thinking, I'm like... going to be able to send my Litecoin to all the merchants in the world that accept it. Ooh. <laughs> Katie Litecoin, is that you? Uh, Jester, make that uh, read that tweet that you you put up earlier because I thought it was a pretty good one. Jeez. I wrote that at like five a.m. Uh, well, come back to me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, Katie. As far as I know, it's basically they're just like Robin Hooding, uh, PayPal with with Bitcoin and and some other shit coins and stuff. So. But like Ben said, that I guess maybe you'll be able to send it to merchants and stuff eventually. On another live stream earlier today on Twitter, I heard somebody saying that PayPal was considering about buying some um, um, some tech company in crypto space, like acquiring them and making them part of a PayPal. So who do you think is that? No idea. Um, is it like a shitcoin company or or a Bitcoin com like? Not a Bitcoin company. I wouldn't think so. It was a custodial custodial crypto company. So our ideas were like uh, Coinbase, Abra, whatever else is there. Robinhood, I guess. Can you buy other stuff on Robinhood? I never used. It. Can you yeah. buy shitcoins? Yeah, I mean, don't you remember the Dogecoin pump on Robinhood? No, I really don't. You know, I actually like I actually met a guy who was like, Yeah, I learned about Bitcoin through Dogecoin. I'm like, wait, what? Like I'm like what fucking universe are you in that you first buy Dogecoin and they're like, Oh, there's a Bitcoin. You trade on Robin Hood. Like, how how is it <laughs> happening? Somebody comes to to you and like, oh yeah, there is this coin that is like it's real money because it it's backed by memes or what? Like, <laughs> how are they explaining it? Yeah, you're you're laughing about it, but I was actually shilling, not shilling, but like I was promoting Dogecoin at some point in my life. Not promoting, but I was like, I was thinking that Bitcoin is too technical and it's too difficult for people to understand. But if they just see this new whatever meme coin and it's very easy to send then eventually it will be like good on ramp to bitcoin yeah some years back i was like yeah yeah dogecoin you know funny coin nice it's not very complicated just for laughs you know and so yeah maybe it's one of the ways yeah i mean i know uh, a certain shit coiner that uh always gets in beefs with bitcoiners claims that doggy coin or dogecoin is the the more inclusive friendly coin in that it's Bitcoin and Dogecoin, and and that's how uh, we'll get we'll get people into the Bitcoin space. But Katie, was the person young or was he old? He was about thirty or so. Yeah, he was thirty year old. He was from Los Angeles. Well, maybe maybe he was on TikTok and just seeing all the Robin Hood TikTok traders talking about Dogecoin and how they're gonna pump it. Well, it was actually a little over a year ago, so. TikTok wasn't around just here, not that much. Hmm. Interesting. Mm. All right. Well, uh, anyone got some thoughts or, or, or actually, Jester, did you find your tweet? Yeah. Uh, so just like on the PayPal announcement, um, you know, I, I was, I was just thinking about like when uh, they were, they were participating in cutting off the flow of funds to WikiLeaks after they, you know, did a big, a big drop, um, and like they were subjected to like government pressure to like stop WikiLeaks. Um, and like the U S couldn't really stop the flow of money that would be illegal, but they could pressure corporations to not send money to Wiki WikiLeaks. Um, so I, uh, shared that PayPal announcement by saying, uh, financial censorship experts discover obvious, uh, uh, which is, you know, when Bitcoin was first involved in sending some fun leaks to keep doing what they were doing. For sure. Well, uh, I think uh, the next top. Does anyone have some some more thoughts on this, or or we'll we'll keep it moving. Oh, I was just gonna say I have a special place in my heart for Dogecoin because. 
it was one of the few things that kept me, kept me focused on the space back in 2014. So it was uh, it was one of the few bright lights of that very difficult year to uh, to uh, hodl. So yeah. Are you still holding what? Doge? <laughs> no, I actually never owned it. it was, <laughs> I just really liked following the space. Optimus, you sound like you're about to go off. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I... <laughs> uh, uh, anyways, I plead the fifth. I plead the fifth. Uh, we'll, we'll go into uh, the next topic, which... Uh, it's been it's been blowing up Twitter. Um, so a few weeks ago, we had Michael Saylor come into Bitcoin, and this week we have a uh, weak-handed Keith McCullough getting blown up on Twitter. So uh, how how many of you guys are blocked by him now? Me. <laughs> I only commented once too, and he blocked me right away. I'm blocked, but I called him a cantillionaire cuck, and so I felt like that was kind of fair. <laughs> Oh my god! Was wasn't totally I, unwarranted. <laughs> I got retweeted by him and not blocked. I don't know. Does that remove my Bitcoiner card? What did he retweet? What are you? I said, um, let me find the tweet. It was like just a bullish tweet on Bitcoin. Interesting. Was, was I, something about Quad Four. Yeah, right. Are you a no, trader now, it Ben? Was like, <laughs> God no. <laughs> Well, what did you guys watch the Michael Saylor, uh, Keith McCullough, um, one-on-one that came out yesterday? I listened to it. Uh, just so you know, Ben is a closet quad four maximalist. <laughs> <laughs> it is known. <laughs> uh, what were I your thoughts it on it, too. Jim? It was really or, good. Or Skeef, yeah. Oh, yeah, Skeef, go in, because we were talking about it last night. Oh, yeah. Uh, it was... I don't know. I thought that it was just really, I don't know, because I've met a lot of people like that Keith guy that are just kind of your textbook, MBA, you know, local optimization, just trying to maximize things in the short term. Like I've known a lot of those people and it was just so refreshing to see him get just body slammed over and over <laughs> again. And like when he, like the, I don't know, it's like the third time he brings up vintage wine and he's like talking about that that's like even relevant to the conversation. And Sailor's like, oh fuck are you talking about like i just i was really i was actually really impressed that he didn't like flex on him a lot harder i thought that would have been pretty badass but it was good it was really good worth listening to for sure yeah i i literally i had one of those like full wtf moments when he basically went bitcoin is wine and you could see like michael saylor was also sitting there like bro are you really comparing bitcoin to wine like you don't understand this at all I really loved how he was um he was like making fun of him but was re- being really nice about it like Keith was saying um like oh I I understand bitcoin a little bit and and Michael Saylor goes like if you understood bitcoin you wouldn't be selling it and it was just like mic drop right there and I was like yeah you know <laughs> like <laughs> like the, you know cyber hornets for the win dude but uh yeah I mean one thing I noticed for sure and uh, Hoddle was in here for a moment, and we were talking about it before we were recording, is that it was very obvious to me that he was shilling his, like, trading algorithms, and it, he was basically, like, join my paid group, you know? And so it was just, it was, you know, kind of irritating to watch if Michael Saylor didn't body slam him so much. And, and you could just tell that Keith is a dollar maximalist, and he's just, you know, looking for, for more fiat gains and and trying to i guess not not lose money like not lose dollars but try try to just maximize as many dollars that that he can get but overall i, I thought it was a pretty good um one on one but in addition to him body slamming Keith over and over again i think it was really cool that michael Saylor also tried to um you know suggest that Keith put certain charts and certain graphs in his in his um in his paid group in the future like he was saying look i can't find you know certain comparisons mm, of bitcoin yeah. to gold or bitcoin to oil or bitcoin to you know all kind of different assets that are there and um keith was kind of like oh yeah yeah i'll do that i'll do that and i feel like you know even if he felt embarrassed for the most part he might actually put some of these charts in there in the future which is good he for should 
Yeah, he definitely should if he's going to be an honest trader. Uh, hey, uh, Optimus, you hit the nail on the head. He thinks in dollars. He's always reverting back to every trade has to revert back to dollars. That's how he sees his profits. Michael Saylor, I think, now sees his profits in Bitcoin. And if you're trading Bitcoin, you should be making a trade that lands you back in Bitcoin on every trade if you're denominating in, in Bitcoin. And Keith's just not there yet. Maybe we'll get I'll him. I'll tell there. you one thing. Get it, Farface. I'll tell you one thing. Uh, Michael Saylor is really registering with a lot of friends of mine. They're uh, listening to him, and um, he's really registering. I mean, when he talks about, like, 10 years ago, you know, to make $50,000 off a 10-year bond, you had to have a million dollars, and now you got to have $10 million to make 50000 That registers with a lot of fucking people in their 50s, you know, late 40s, 50s. 60s who are trying to, you know, they're, they're trying to plan for their fucking retirement and that registers with them. And this guy's fucking talking the truth. He's a, he's a great advocate. Yeah, yeah it's Ben. I you totally wanna... agree with, oh, go I ahead, agree man. with that sentiment. He's a great advocate and he, he's really thought it through. He has a, has a good way to articulate uh, exactly what you were just saying. It's a way of saying um, how to look at something and what, what are your real gains? I mean, I think I can't imagine Keith didn't, he didn't hit a couple of nerves with Keith because Keith understands the words he's using. You know what I mean? Uh, Michael Saylor did a great job of being respectful, but really given digging, digging into his theory, his, his, his angle, you know, Keith, he's a trader denominates in dollars and doesn't see Bitcoin as new money. He sees it as an investment. You got to get in and out. And you got to time it, and no one's going to do that. Michael Saylor even said that. Yeah, but you guys not gonna do that, and they shouldn't have to do that. And when you talk to, you listen to a guy like Pierre Richard just talking about the idea of money, and that you store your productivity for the future. Um, that's what Michael Saylor's thinking. He's like, I, I don't want it to melt away, right? And that's what money's supposed to do. People are not supposed to have to trade to store their value. They're not supposed to have to. Think about managing their savings. So to be able to save your money and it's still there in the future, maybe even worth more. You know, because you, you used to get interest on your money. You could put money in the bank 30, 40 years ago and just let it go and it would keep getting bigger. That's gone. Governments took that all away. You know, so Bitcoin gives it back and Michael Saylor sees it and Keith McCullough does not. Oh, even if it doesn't give it back, even if it doesn't give it back, it protects you from the debasement, which is fucking humongous, especially yes, in your even, later. Right. At a minimum, at least you don't get the debasement. But again, you know, a, you, you put together Michael Saylor and Jeff Booth. I can't wait for that interview. And Jeff <laughs> talking about the natural, the natural lowering of prices through efficiency gains that every single employer is always looking for. I hire people. I hire subcontractors, everybody. We all want to keep our prices low and our profits higher. That's just how, that's a natural tendency. That everybody's trying to do it. And if you could get a machine to cut out some of your costs, you're going to buy the machine or invent one. And that's what humanity does. So everything should always get cheaper. Jeff Booth hit the nail on the head. With hard money in society, everything will just continue to get cheaper. People will have more free time in their lives. Efficiency would score, go through the roof. People wouldn't have to work nearly as hard to survive. I mean, just every, it would just be a paradise, literally. And it could happen. A lot of things have to change, of course. But the, the fundamentals get... actually are here now with Bitcoin. We have a hard money that humanity can now work with and turn all this bullshit around because that's what we need. You got to get to the hard money. It doesn't. That's it. We know, got it. Yeah. With every great uh, blessing, there comes a curse. What do you think the curse of hyper deflation would be? I mean, I don't want to call it hyper deflation, but you know, a more aggressive deflation than society's ever seen before. Because if we have a hard money and we continue to be efficient, you're going to see a faster deflation than we've ever seen. And what do you think the, the curse of that would be or the, the, the pros and cons? And like the con is people are less willing to give up their money for like investments. So like it might be harder to like do a startup or something because people don't need to see yield on their money. They just... You know, it's most, more likely just a better idea to just hold their Bitcoin versus like today you see like VC investors just throwing money around because 
it's just easier to so yeah um, but that would change people would be much more selective on what they invest in and people seeking money would have way better um arguments for why they deserve it they would have to prove why they deserve it more you wouldn't have icos they wouldn't happen nobody would give them a dime they'd say where's your product let's see what it does i'm not invested in something you say you're going to build that would never happen it would completely change a lot of things so you know it could go both ways the one problem that i would see is um salaries would have to come down along with prices people would it would be hard for people to adjust and those that control the current system are going to fight like hell and so this uh, so much propaganda is going to be thrown out to try to keep people not fleeing the fiat currency. I mean, it's going to be tumultuous. It's, it's not going to be a smooth ride, but it could be relatively bloodless if it doesn't happen too fast. I agree with you, yeah. Bobo, that if it goes too fast, it could be. I, I can't even imagine, you know, some crazy black swan shows up that nobody thought of. You know, since the world's never really seen that, you, you really can't know. But overall it should be better for society that's my it, understanding it can't be all of a sudden like a heroin addict just being fucking taken off a of heroin <laughs> you know yeah. what i mean ben the carmen the concept you mentioned would be called this lowering of velocity of money and i've been trying to figure out like how the velocity of money affects economy probably like about a year ago i, I don't really remember anything but that's something that you just reminded me it would be interesting to look into again yeah definitely yeah i mean i i'm i'm kind of with fartface on the like the one thing that would be a con is like say that happened relatively quickly within a few years and we saw mass hyper deflation in everything we still have a lot of of the average people not holding bitcoin and so there, you know, they they would be hit really hard while yeah. while some of us would would be prospering, and so it would definitely make a an imbalance in society, and and maybe making us targets, and and you know the other effects that that might lead to. So let's hope it's a slow transition, in my opinion, or slower transition. But uh, Ben, did did you wanna did you wanna talk about uh? Uh, Michael Saylor and and Keith McCullough, I think you were saying in the chat, Ben the car man. Uh, I was thinking I could talk about the light L and D vulnerabilities. Oh, okay. Well, let's let's jump on that then. <laughs> Hold on, one one thing, one thing. Get it. Slower the transition, better the stacking. <laughs> there we go. The we got the back. <laughs> Listen. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if I could ride this fucking thing parabolic. You know what I mean? Fucking nuts. I ra I like stacking. Stacking's me. All right. Well, I mean, we're like, I, I've been saying it for a while, you know, like I'm never going to not save in Bitcoin. So I'll always be stacking, but there's just like in a, like something's going to die in me when, when it's like, I don't know, 50, a hundred K and, you know, like my measly little stacks are getting me, you know, like little baby sats. And so it's like we were, we talked about it a while ago when, when Bitcoin broke 10 K and we couldn't get a million sats for a hundred bucks. We were all sitting here like, man, like it's so bittersweet. Like I can't buy a million sats for a hundred bucks anymore. And, but you know, the price goes up. So yeah, I, I'm with you FF. Like, dude, it's the crazy experience in my life. I mean, it, it's like you said, bittersweet. It's the it's the exact. That's what it is. It's bittersweet. You're right, but you're like right. Fuck. <laughs> like slow it down. I think Jackie said it today earlier. It's like, uh, guys, can we not go parabolic and slow down this price action? So I think we're all feeling it right now, but we're also kind of excited. But uh, yeah, Nick, you got anything? Anyone else? Anyone else got some? This thoughts? is where if we if we had a guy like Vitalik behind things, we can just tell him to slow it down for us. <laughs> Savage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Please, dude. Uh, code is law, right? Code is law. Um. Well, uh. 
Ben, did you want to jump into the lightning stuff? Sure. Um, I'll be the very bad news for you guys. But uh, there's two pretty bad vulnerabilities in LND, and um, they're fixed in the latest update. So make sure you update your node if you are running uh, a lightning node, Spe specifically LND, which most people do. But um, one of um, both of them had to do with like uh, someone could basically like grief your channel and steal funds. Um, one of them had to do where there's a consensus rule in Bitcoin where there's like a size restriction on your signature and this wasn't enforced by LND. So someone could uh, like give you a signature and then um, that's like too big. And then your LND would still validate it and say it's like good to go. And then when you try to close it, it won't be a valid transaction because your signature is too big. So then you couldn't like claim your funds. And so that was pretty bad. But uh did the attacker now. get back those funds though? Is that is a lot of stuff, yeah, yeah. they can yeah, get them so back. Like, no, no, your attacker could like directly like steal the entire channel because like you would try to claim the revocation transaction, but you wouldn't have a valid signature for it because um, the signature that your counterparty gave you wasn't valid. So and there was no like, automatic check in the software to verify that, so somebody saw that. Yeah, yeah, like, um, like they they verify the signature, but like they weren't verifying it. the The size was like the correct uh, as well. So, um, interesting. Yeah. Do we know who disclosed the vulnerability? Yes. Yeah, it was, it was Antoine Riard. Found Thank it in like you. April. But uh, it was like a month before LND 0.10 came out, so they waited a while to. Uh, and it was like too late to like ninja hide it in the thing, so they it's like been in there for like a while now. But uh, damn, yeah. that always scares me. So yeah. then, is it a? Is it? It sounds like it's fixable. Is that? That's the first question. Is that accurate? Yeah, it's already fixed in uh, okay. the latest update of LND. So if you upgrade your node, you're not vulnerable. All right. And considering that most Lightning channels are not very big right now, and it doesn't even sound like it's ever been exploited, it sounds like a low risk thing. I mean, it's, it always sucks when when we find them, but yet it's also good that we find them if they happen to be there. I guess it sucks that they are there. And then when they get found, at least that's good. It doesn't sound like a big bad thing to me am i not making enough of it i mean it's bad that it's in there but like you'd have like to actually exploit this you'd have to know that it's there and then like you know like write custom software to be actually be able to exploit it so there's probably only like less than 200 people on the planet that could actually pull this off and uh but it seems like it has it because barely any channels actually get like um like force closed and uh, like the per the person stealing the funds, so likely it didn't happen. But yeah. Yeah. For for me personally, like right now, I will have to close around hundred channels, and if you've seen meme mempool recently, I think it's going to be pretty painful to do it right now. Well, if you just upgrade, you don't need to close your channels. Yeah, man. I'm uh, I'm untechnical pleb. I'm running as one. So basically, I'm screwed. Yeah. Shit. Well, I think Nick Nick did a guide on uh, converting your Casa to I forget which implementation, but Christopher. Yeah. Or Nick. Oh yeah, I just wanted to uh, clear up any confusion because uh, there's there's two vulnerabilities. Uh, there's the griefing attack, which used Yager. Um, brought up, which uh, with a griefing attack, you're just locking up the channel, so you can't get funds through, and you also, like, the, the channel just becomes, like, inactive, so you're not losing funds. This latest uh, vulnerability, which we got the full details on uh, late yesterday, that is it. You know, one where you can lose funds, um, and that that is, like, patchable 
if, if you can upgrade your node to 0 0.11, um, you will you won't be susceptible to that attack. Yeah, and like the nice thing about this is like the use Jaeger's thing that he published, like that's kind of just like an inherent property of the Lightning Network and how it works. Like there are ways to mitigate it, but it's not fully solvable versus this was just like a bug in the software that they patched and now it's not a bug. So um, it's a solvable problem, which is nice. I I feel like we're we've been very lucky the development of of the bitcoin protocol the lightning protocol and everything that interacts with it has been staying ahead just at least enough that nothing has destroyed this thing yet uh, nobody's been so wrecked yet unless you were a fool and didn't hold your own keys or something stupid but you know all these bugs i've been hearing about including this one right now and i did hear about the other one uh that you uh, brought up on a podcast somewhere um you know we we've been lucky we got smart people that really care and we're staying ahead of the people like like ben just said there might be 200 people on the planet so of those 200 people how many of them are malicious and is it worth their time and do they even know about it and so like we're lucky we're lucky there's a million hackers out there that could have exploited this and started targeting people and then i got a bunch of channels have to get shut down and just like i don't know who said it but you know Closing channels, especially if you have a lot that starts getting expensive, it's an indirect attack against, you know, your own value. Even if you don't lose direct Bitcoin, you still got to spend money to do it. So it's not good ever. But hey, you, again, you know, I th my feeling, I could be totally off just from an outsider's perspective, watching this whole thing evolve for several years now. We've been doing pretty damn good. We, I say we, you know, I'm not a coder. I don't, I just get to watch and clap. But they're doing a great job, as far as I can tell, you know. And I, guys like you, Ben, that tell us, and we get to, you know, help others understand it and, and help pay attention to it, give feedback. This is a, it's a great ecosystem. Uh, most everybody in it really cares. So I think we're a very lucky group of humans right now on this planet that are all involved in this whole thing. Agreed uh any any more thoughts on the, on this one guys because uh we're getting close to an hour but we have one more that that nick brought up yesterday that i think we want to get to all right we can jump right into that all right well uh on that note um we heard this way this week that one of the one of our favorite bitcoin heels peter schiff got in trouble for uh evading taxes or helping his clients evade taxes via i think it was the gold market so nick do you want to jump into that since you uh, brought it up yesterday sure i didn't dive too deep into the actual like details of it but from what i heard is he was just helping um his clients tax evade through gold and i think you said this last night or Justifer said this that his dad was like you know, oh, super yeah. die hard about this, like, and he died in jail or something because he refused to pay his taxes and just, you know, ended up rotting there. But um, even though a lot of people hate Peter Schiff, I've learned a shit ton of, from him about, like, Austrian economics and capitalism in general. And I like Peter Schiff. I think he is totally bullshitting about hating on Bitcoin because he knows that was um because he has to literally sell gold for his business and bitcoin's a direct competitor to it so if something's a threat to you and your business of course you're going to talk awful about it um i personally think he owns bitcoin and he has it i know his son does i so actually think that uh like bitcoiners are going to be his customers in the, in the next all time high like how many people actually class at the middle of bull market and, and bear markets so he just found the market that is Who's the person you're gonna go buy gold winner at night? The only name you, that pops up in your head is Peter. So like I, yeah, fuck yeah. 
Good job. I don't like Peter Schiff, but I wouldn't uh, convict him of anything yet. Um, he, you know, listen, it, it, I, t I take his side right now. And whatever he's doing, I take his side. <laughs> and I don't like the man, but I don't, I don't like the other side. That's fair. Facts. Um, yeah, I agree. Like, yeah, go I don't ben. think money laundering or tax evasion should be crime. So, in my mind, he's done nothing immoral. So, there's no way Peter Schiff owns Bitcoin on this. Like, he's not playing 4D chess. He's a boomer. <laughs> they're fucking. They're stupid, <laughs> they're they're retarded psychopathic children. Have you met them? Like, except with the exception of like a few, like Surfer Jim, who's cool. You know I mean? Well, thank you. I don't mean to group you in, Surfer Jim, but the rest of your generation is dog shit. But hey, <laughs> oh, dude, you don't have to tell me. I can't relate to any of them. They're a bunch dude, of dumb heads. Dude, I'm a fucking millennial, and you know we're we're worse than you guys because we're the spawn of you guys. So I fucking hate my generation <laughs> too. You know. Well, it's tough, man. It's it. It's tough all around. Most people just don't get it. I think Nick's generation is going to get it a lot faster than mine or yours, you know. I hope. I have hope for the Bitcoin Zoomer future. Yep. I have hope for the Bitcoin Zoomers, not the normie Zoomers, though. They're following the same path as everyone else. Yeah. They're out there, like, protesting and being like, we're making a difference, my bros. <laughs> no, you're not. Dude, the amount of people I have on Snapchat that went out to protest and just sat on a lawn with a uh, with a picket stick for like four hours, and they're like, "Yeah, we're doing stuff. We're we're being the change we want to see." Like, no, the fuck, you're not. <laughs> what does that even fucking mean? Be the change you want to see. Like, vote with your wallet. That's that's what that should really. It's be. true. That's protest theater. What they think they think they're accomplishing something by gathering in a group, blocking a road. Helicopters overhead with news cameras filming the whole thing. They all go home at the end of the day like, yeah, that was great. And nothing fucking happened. Yeah. Donald's got it right, man. You fucking vote with your money, man. You got to pay. You got to make things happen. This is why it's going to change. Because guys like us are going to be fucking hugely wealthy. And we're going to dictate where the money goes. Not the everything, shit run things now. Everything's a fucking power grab, dude. Where, where do you think a lot of the hippie organizers from the 1960s ended up after the fucking cultural revolution was over? They ended up on fucking Wall Street because it was never about hippie bullshit. It was a fucking power grab. All of this is just an ideological cover story for power. And, you know, Bitcoiners are doing the same shit. We have an ideological cover story for power, too. And we're grabbing at power in a way that people really can't fuck with. Like, we have a weapon with which we can use to grab power. And everybody else is just going about it, like, through political means. Which is fucking, it's not going to work, you know. Hey, can I add to that by saying that the power that we gain by, by being the, the, the majority holders of the units within this protocol, the power we gain is different than the power that the people that have power now have. Meaning yes, they have I a agree. power that allows them to make more of this money and control way more shit. We can't ever do that. So we can only control what we actually have. And we are only going to trade that for real value. That's going to straighten the shit up out of everybody else. They can't fuck with us. We're going to say, get, no, I'm not trading my stats yeah. for your bullshit. It's going to straighten. I, businesses are going to get more uh, honorable. Products are going to get better. Everybody's going to do it better. Your landscape is going to cut your lawn better because you're going to fucking fire them next time because another guy's going to want your sats. It's going to exactly. make a huge difference, and you, it's just going to change the structure of everybody. Every every incentive is going to totally change. And the guys with the power, us, are not going to abuse it. We're not going to take advantage of people. We're not going to screw people up. Like, all right, so some people's going to try and steal and rob and cheat and whatever, but it, it still changes everything because you don't want to let go of those sets very easily. You know, it's just, I don't know. I see yeah. a much better world. No, I, 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 like, I agree with you. Like, the way that, like, the current people in power, like, 
inf- use their power is like through intimidation and like violence versus like in a Bitcoin eyes world like Bitcoiners will use their power just by paying people. So like it's a lot yeah. nicer of a system and you know more socially scalable and all that. Yeah, it's, but, it's, yeah, but, it's but paying people for, for value. You can't pay people to go and cheat other people because what end up, ends up happening is people get caught cheating, right? Like yeah, like Jamie Dimon gets caught, you know, money laundering billions of dollars and pays some ridiculous fine back to the people who control the money anyway, and everybody gets or, a slap or on the wrist. Or spoofing, and... spoofing the gold market. Whatever it, whatever it might be, in a in a hard money world, that that gets cut off right there the first time that that happens. Nobody deals with that guy anymore. They don't want to lose their own reputation. They don't want to own their their. Their limited supply of the money system that they have, it, it just it just changes everything. Um, you, you could cheat, but you, you can't perpetually cheat. You, you'll get ratted out and people will, will shun you, push you out of society, do what they have to do at, to, to root that bullshit out. That's, what cha- that's what's going to change. Boys, what excites me the most is in a hard money world, you will reap the rewards of your production, meaning... You will actually fucking get what you produce, and you'll be able to retain it. I mean, that's, that's literally the other side of what I'm just saying. The guy who wants my sets can only get them from his hard labor, but it's got to be good, solid work. Yeah, that's, but it's his hard labor, and he gets it. paid, and he gets paid in hard money for giving me some good value. And the first time he cheats me. He loses my value. I tell everybody never to deal with that guy. He either straights up or he starves. Hey, even what, if, even if I'm the guy that's cutting the lawn, you know, I'm one of the hard criti- money. one of the one of the criticisms that you know like gets, uh, and it's accurate, right? Like people say that we are making dynastic wealth worse, and that's true. I mean, like my children are going to be much richer than the children of the people who didn't stack. And the people who didn't stack, your children will have to work for my children. Face hard facts, right? But you can also like have much longer time horizons, and you can be like, I expect my children to be good stewards of this money, not ruin the family name, not fucking uh, do immoral things, not cheat and lie if they're running a business, or fuck over the consumer or the customer, right? Like I always use the example of uh, the Mickelhennies who have been running Tabasco for five generations. And they're just, like, happily putting out a great product. Everybody fucking loves Tabasco. They don't fuck over anybody. They're just out on their island, Avery Island, in Louisiana, just fucking making hot sauce that we all enjoy. Like, and that's a multi-generational story, like a storied American brand that's been just, like, you know, all positive. And that's, we can have more of that kind of shit. We can have these multi-generational projects that, you know, families or structures take on. I think the one thing that we we don't talk about probably enough in Bitcoin, but maybe there's no solution to it because maybe it's just natural, is all oligarchical power, right? Like capital colludes. The fact that we're all on a call together and we all hold a certain amount of Bitcoin, this is capital colluding right here, right? Like this is power consolidating. And so like the wealthy will always serve their own interest. And there, that's one thing we don't fix. But I agree with Surfer Jim that it's more it's more fair in general as a system for in the aggregate right extrapolate on your example with your multi-generational wealth um anybody who inherits a whole bunch of money they can piss it away and be poor again or they can manage it well now if your your offspring or their offspring are inheriting some intergenerational wealth and they're very wealthy and could live off of it the rest of their lives they might be motivated to leave some behind and they might eventually be motivated to, you know, instead of just living off of it, maybe I should take some in as well. Maybe I should get in a business and people want to, to produce, even if it's just artwork, you know, people don't want to just sit around and get, you know, waste life. They want to do things. So you go and you do something, maybe you don't have to make a big living, but you want to just, just fulfill your life. You want to maybe make something or, or, or produce, uh, you know, contribute to anything. And so you put value back into society. So now if you want to get paid, you're only going to want to get paid in the same value you already, the same money you already value. So you're going to want to put out, you're going to recognize you're not getting rid of your sets for without solid value coming, coming to replace it. 
And then on you're on the other side, you want to earn some, you got to realize, hey, I got to give value as well. And it keeps the scales and, you know, keeps the balance of yeah. good and evil in the right way. Like every eventually, this is how it plays out over multi-generations. Eventually, everybody's going to have to work, right? There's always yeah. like you, you can't. Yeah. Eventually, someone's going to spend down a little too much and go, oh, fuck, man, it's not going to re- last the rest of my life anymore. I got to go to work and I got to earn that, Did, that you know what, money. You know what normally, you know what normally does it? It's, uh, it's divorces that do it because divorces continually have the fortune. So like, if you really are serious about multi-generational wealth for yourself and your family, you need to sit down to your stupid kids and be like, uh, hey, dipshits. First of all, like you need to, the whole family needs to like your significant other. Secondly, they're getting a fucking prenup. End of discussion. You know? <clears throat> yeah, people are going to value that a lot add, differently now. I can see that for sure. Yeah, to add to that, I uh, a while back I read an article that said the average uh, family in the 1% loses, I believe it was 70% of uh the family's wealth within the second generation and 90 percent within the third yep. so uh i definitely agree american hodl a lot of it's divorce but um and that's a really cool story about the tabasco family but they're basically an anomaly and usually yeah they're they're out you know, for sure yeah. but if you look yeah back, exactly like you, you know look, usually if you, if you have a lot of money and you have kids they don't really understand like the value of uh of of working your ass off and and making that money but if you look back in history um you, you know like that shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations thing that's definitely been a standard throughout uh humanity but we've had much more multi-generational families under a gold standard and so we will see uh more people that are like the mickle honey family maybe not it's not going to be the majority of families, obviously, because I agree that like most people will piss away their money, make stupid decisions, want, you know, buy a Ferrari. Like you don't need a fucking Ferrari, all that kind of shit. And uh, like, there's a stat that like something like eighty percent of America's uh, multimillionaires are first generation. So like they're the first generation to make that capital, right? So that'll probably always be that way. So. I totally agree with all this, but what happens when we can program our money to not be spent by our worthless heirs? Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, a, like, pretty, that's a pretty revolutionary uh, idea. People have that's, been trying to do that for, for, for decades. You set up multi-generational trusts, and you have to have trustees that are managing the money. Now, with a multi-sig, you wouldn't need a trustee, but somebody's got to not lose some keys and manage, you know, make them come together one day so famous, could you do it uh, maybe if the people in the future have their shit together otherwise it's lost forever maybe it'll just you better make it raise your kids fucking smart william I mean, william randolph first who citizen kane is based on uh you know he he effectively did that created like one of the first dynastic trusts and uh, he had the money skip his kids <laughs> which is like ruthless but it also like he knew his kids were going to be soft bitches and they weren't going to be able to you know so he had to skip and went to went to the grandchildren, and there. Yeah. So think about still rich. Sorry, uh, what you said, like you're going to teach your kids about hard money. They're going to respect Bitcoin their entire lives, right? And when they get it, they're going to treat it like precious. You know, they're not going to they're not going to piss it away. Now, will their kids get it? If they're smart, they'll tr- they'll. It's like that Tabasco family. They train every kid when they grow up. This is how this works here. Come into the factory. Let me show you right. what you're doing. Get on a factory line, learn, learn from the bottom up, right? They, that's what multi-generational working families do. Everybody gets involved. They know the whole business. They got skin in the game and they all care about it. They care about their customers. They're, they're working in a fiat system, but they, the, the, the values are instilled. The value of owning this money will be instilled into the next generation of kids. Every Bitcoiner that has a child right now, that child will never know a world without Bitcoin. And that parent is never going to not teach that kid what this, how significant of a revolution they're right they, that they were born into. This is like the, this is one of the most world changing events ever in human history, yeah. ever. It's yeah, true. And I mean, it, it, it basically enables you to, whether you have direct control, like through some sort of, you know, programmatic thing, which I think has a lot of flaws because there's just going to be a lot that you're not going to be able to anticipate, you know, that's going to happen in the world after you're dead, right? So, like, really, your best strategy is to raise smart, capable children 
who can improvise and adapt to changing, you know, fast changing circumstances in their world because the pace of uh, technological change will only increase in a Bitcoinized standard, right? But the interesting thing is like, you are able to lock away, especially now, like those of us who were born at the inflection point, you're able to lock away this amount of capital that kind of creates like a sovereign immortality for your belief systems. And so like the best way to, um, like there are projects that you can start now with your capital and your children and your family line, like that might take a thousand years to to bear out, like which is not something you can do in a fiat standard because the money will be stolen from you before you can get to the goal. So it's like that kind of shit is super fucking interesting to me. Yeah, like human nature won't change, but we can make it harder for us to do the same old shit. Mm-hmm. Totally. It's just God about is... unknown. It's just about unknown unknowns because, you know, like what if your um, ancestor was programming shit for you in, in like the 16th century, you know? And they were like, well, obviously, like he's going to need a certain amount of slaves, right? <laughs> like stuff like that. <laughs> and like, so it's like, here's your slave allotment for the month, and you're like, God damn, I can't even spend this on slaves. Fucking illegal now. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Um, you know, I think, uh, I don't know, the, the respect that the money will gain will, will, will cause everybody to, like, just, just tr- I don't know. I feel like it, it, the incentives just realign everybody to, to straighten their act up and, and provide value. I don't, I don't know. I Cash is hard king. To... Cash is king, man. Yeah. Everybody wants that shit. I think we give them too much credit. I think, um, to your point, human action is not going to change. There's still going to be people that try to be bad actors. And uh, most, you know, a lot of criminals, not most, but a lot of criminals are stupid. They do dumb things that do not align with their incentives. So I think even if Bitcoin has, you know, <clears throat> a much better rule set and, you know, you can't debase the money, you can't steal it from people without them knowing, I still think criminals are going to be dumb. They're still going to do stupid shit and they're going to lose their Bitcoin. And there's going to be a lot of families that you hear about that. Oh, yeah, that, that family, you know, their parents had a shit ton of Bitcoin and they lost it all. I, I think those stories are still going to happen. Yeah, oh, so yeah. it's going to be... Everybody's going to be smart enough to build a, a thousand-year plan for their generation. Well, no, yeah. no question. And to have the, like, strength of character to see it through, right? Like, and, I mean, in order to put some of those plans in place, that means... You basically become a, a Satoshian figure, right? Where like you are locked out of spending your own wealth, you know. And uh, not many people have the internal fortitude for a plan of that nature. So, well, that, that's why we're all here on on Twitter, making sure we don't sp- spend our sats and put them to good use into the future <laughs> yeah and, and so that our children you know can read our immortalized thoughts 100 <laughs> years in the future and cringe at the weird stuff their grandparents said <laughs> especially hoddles hey they'll never be able to find mine because all the accounts have been deleted. yeah they all got <laughs> they'll have to and... like piece it together now you see how I've been playing 3D chess the whole time. Oh, yeah, four, 420 dimensions. 40, 40 chess, yeah. that's right. 3D chess is just regular chess. <laughs> It'll be like reading like Dead Sea Scrolls to try to figure out what <laughs> you said. I've been playing 2D chess. Uh, that's what Keith McAuliffe plays. <laughs> No, he's playing. He's playing four quad chess. Four, four quad, quad chess. <laughs> yeah, Jesus, dude. I, he he has such bad timing on his whole. I've sold my whole Bitcoin shit. Like if he had done it a month ago, he, we wouldn't remember it by now. But he just had the worst fucking timing. Well, I saw a tweet where he said that he bought back. I don't know. He said he bought back like once he sold and was trying to like dunk on someone. He's like. I bought back already, like catch up or something like that. And it's like, all right, whatever, well, dude. Welcome him back into the fold. Never too late. <laughs> yeah. He's dude. He's just one of these scammer guys. He's the same scammer we see in the fucking, uh, 
the altcoin space, which is like, check out my sick gains, quad four, buy my trading course. Except his course is more expensive because he went to Yale. Yeah. <laughs> what was that, Katie? Yeah, his floorboards. His floorboards suck. He has linoleum. He has a shitty guitar in him. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> hey, man. That guy That guy was a huge LARP. What's his face? <laughs> I don't know if anybody caught... I, I fucking drove him off the, uh, the, the Bitcoin Magazine stream, too. <laughs> who was Wait, that? who? Uh, Jeremy Ross. What the fuck? Who is he? Uh, he's just some shit coiner. You don't need to worry about him. But he was one of these. <laughs> he was one of these have fun staying poor guys. And he was Justine. <laughs> Justine brought him into Dirtbag Friday and was like, and he was like, oh Ethereum, you get a thousand percent APY. I'm making all this money, and so I just started belittling him for being poor. <laughs> <laughs> Did she dude, know he was into ETH when she invited him? I mean, it seems a little odd. Well, he's one of these guys who's like half Bitcoin, half ETH, but really he's he's just, if you're half Bitcoin, half ETH, you're all ETH. It's like, you can't be a little gay, you know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I ended up talking to a shit coiner. I, I went, so the guy that puts on BitDevs in New York, which is a super technical, awesome event, we were all sick of not having a get together. So he just says, let's, let's just meet at Washington square park. And we just sat on the lawn for like three, four hours last night, just chatting. But this one dude that showed up, I never saw him. He's wearing a bunch of Bitcoin gear and he knew a lot of stuff, but it turns out he's into some, he's got this global coin and I look it up. It's like seven eighty nine on coin market cap. It's got like, like 3 million in market cap or something. I'm going, dude, you, what do you think? What, why are you here? I don't know. I don't know. How... People had to walk away because they started to realize. And I'm just going, holy shit, man. It's crazy it's everywhere. I, could, I had it. The guy didn't even know. He tried to tell me that the miners control the network. I'm like, dude, I control the fucking network. Me and all my buddies that have full <laughs> nodes. If the miner tries to put together a transaction and send it to me, I tell him to fuck off. The <laughs> guy was clueless. He didn't even know that. And he's had a Bitcoin meetup. And I'm going, so. We're still early, way early. Were you losing your shit on him, Jim? Uh, after a while, man, because <laughs> I, I brought up some, I brought up open timestamps, and he's like, "What is that?" I go, "What is that?" You said you've been into this since 2013. Did you tell me? I don't know. I he he talked Bitcoin the whole time until like I'm talking for like an hour, and at the end he starts saying. You know about this global? I forget what he called it. Global something coin. I go, no. What is that? He goes. This is the shit, dude. And I went, what? Like, I thought he was bullshitting me. I thought he was like trying to, you know, just bullshit me and see if I would fall for it. And I'm just looking, I'm like, what are you talking about? You know? And he just was serious. He goes, no, we're using this right now in Africa. I got people using this and you got to see, like, just in the last couple of weeks, it went from like 20 cents to $2. And I'm like, oh, a pump and dump? And I pull up the chart, and there's two huge spikes on the chart. I'm like, oh, so two pump and dumps for you guys. And I just start belittling the guy to his face. Like, I'm, I'm like, what are you doing, dude? I don't know. It was weird. I don't know. He, something you said triggered me to bring this guy up. Some people talking shit or something. That dude from uh, that was that Justine brought in or whatever. Yeah. I was like, what is this guy doing here? But whatever. He was a nice guy. Ultimately, you know, wasn't like a dick or anything, but he's kind of clueless. Kind of to me. Uh, 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 SJW affinity scammer. There you go. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, Nick, we've uh we've been going for I don't know about an hour and a half or something. Hour and twenty. Should we wrap this up and then we can we can all sit in here and talk afterwards? Yeah. All right. So uh, anyone anyone want to say some last words? Anything that they uh, want to get in before we end this stream? No. All right. Or Bobo, Katie. The... Your connection sucks. You're breaking up. 
<laughs> yeah, we didn't we didn't hear that, guys. Oh, guys, it's about to get real. Oh, <laughs> we got that, that is bar. true. We got that last part about to get real. Well, yeah. On on that note, guys, um, it seems like we are gonna be seeing some price pumps, so uh, we better buckle in. You guys better not be selling any sats unless you really need them, or else we're all gonna be shaming you guys. So, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. stay humble, stack sats. Anyone want to say last thing? Nope. Oh, uh, oh. I've. Uh, I think I recognize a lot of names from Bitblock Boom, and I just want to say hello again, you all. Uh, I don't think I've talked to anybody in person since then, but uh, Andrew, Ski, Foddle, Ben. Uh, we crossed paths down to Dallas, but good to see y'all again. What's up, Charlie? Good hey, what's up, you. man? Yeah, what's up? Low key doxing him right there, bro. No, I don't care. It's my, oh, it's my first, middle, and last name. Y'all know who I am. Sorry, Charlie. My Twitter handle. Okay. <laughs> no. I, I just doxed myself with my own name, so it's okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I'll see you next week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Come back, dude. We're here every week. I'll yeah, I, I didn't know that. I, I, I'm in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so I don't really have many other Bitcoiners in town, but it's good to uh, jump on a voice chat. Yeah, man. It's... Uh... It's refreshing to come in here every week and, and just chill with the boys and, and girls and, and talk about Bitcoin. It's good. The crowd's growing every week, too, you guys. It's, it's good. I know. Any of you guys that stay muted all night, you need to jump in and let's hear what you got to say, man. This isn't just us. All right, I'll say so. Let's be a big team. I, you guys have heard of the concept of workout partners for going to the gym. And the whole point is to have accountability. You can't show up and leave the other person hanging. So I found some friends to stack sats with. They're sats stacking accountability partners. So instead of like small amounts that I tend to purchase every day, we force each other to buy a lot. Well, I have a lot of out of shape fiat friends I can bring. Yeah. Yeah, that's, but it's, it doesn't we all do. do the gym. It's just more forcing your friends to buy a lot with you. That's, that's is that what like Twitter on is. top of them? Is that on top of them BCA? Like you force them to smash buy? Because I, I would think BCA is the the way I'd want all my friends to end up buying, right? Yeah, but times like these are getting crazy now. You need the Here. FOMO stacks with the boys. <laughs> Just a different form of DCA. Yeah. Here, let's let's end the recording here and continue this conversation after. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, big boss, we're we're on that. All right, so I think this is episode thirty-two, and uh, we're out for this week. We'll see you next week, guys. Thanks for coming out. Like we say every episode, you guys make the show, so appreciate it. And uh, with that, we're gonna end it. So peace out, guys. Peace.